Up next is our very special showstopper session that promises to deliver some mind-bending insights on how to gain an edge in the financial markets. We all know how challenging it can be to convert profits and gain a strategic edge in the financial markets. But there are ways to get around it, get better and turn efforts into great results. How? Let's hear it from our speaker and CEO and head portfolio manager at Vespola Capital Management, Jeff Tomasulo. Right. Thank you so much for all showing up. The last time I spoke, and this is how you know financial education and the stock market scares the you know what out of people because I was at a conference of 1,600 people of real estate, 30 people showed up. So I'm very excited to be able to share with you guys today what I have learned over the last 27 years. Now, in the, I only have 30 minutes to try to share that. So I'm gonna speak quickly uh, because I know what I share with you today if you apply it, can change your financial lives. But before we do that, I want to ask you guys a question. And if anybody gets this question correct, I'm going to give you 100 bucks. Sounds pretty good, right? Is that all right? Yeah. All right, right? It's again at lunchtime. I know everybody's hungry, but hopefully 100 bucks will make up for it. So there is a tool that every, not every, but most extremely wealthy people have used to create their wealth. The first person that I see that answers that question will get the 100 bucks. What is that tool? Nope. No. <laughs> no, come on, let's go. Wait, what? Close. What? I didn't hear him, what did he say? Hard work, that's true, but no, there's a Leveraging. Who did it? Right there. Leverage. Think about that. Wow. That was really good. What's your name? Bob. Bob. Awesome. Good job. Bob gets 100 bucks. Now, leverage is a dirty word on Wall Street, especially to a lot of retail investors. Right? They don't want you to use leverage. Why? Because leverage, if you don't have the right education, Right? You don't have the proper knowledge on how to use leverage, it's like an atomic bomb. It could destroy you. But if you have the right education, you have the right team around you, the right mentors, right? We heard about mentors at this conference already. And you have someone supporting you, leverage can transform your life. So I'm going to talk to you, and I forgot my little clicker here. Hopefully I know how to use this. I'm gonna just play a little video of you for me real quick. So you guys, if it comes up, if it doesn't, we're gonna skip it. But there it is, so you guys get a little idea of who I am. Oh, it did not work, did it? All right, forget it. So over the last 10 years, there has been a lot of crazy you know what going on in the economy and in the market, right? The first five years of the last 10 years have been quite amazing. If many of you looked at your 401ks, you were like, all right, I feel pretty wealthy. And then something changed. Something happened to your money, right? We had a pandemic that we haven't seen since 1918, right? We've had inflation that we haven't seen in over 40 years. And then the one constant in our, in over the last 20 years, interest rates have gone up quicker than any time in the bond market. In the US bond market, which has been around for almost 175 years, we've seen interest rates go up quicker than ever before. And that has made everything that we do, right? We go lease a car, it's more expensive. We go buy a car, it's more expensive. We go buy a house, it becomes more expensive. Our interest rates, which I don't know if, if you guys are looking at those interest rates on your credit cards, are gone up, I mean, to levels of 25, 30%. That is insane. But the one constant that we have done at Vestibule Capital Management, which is my hedge fund in Greenwich, Connecticut, and what we have done in our, uh, our financial education company called Tactical Income, but especially in the fund. Over those last 10 years, my clients have had an average return 
of 25% a year. And last year, when the S&P 500 went down 29%, the NASDAQ, which makes up all of those uh, tech stocks that we love and hate, you know, the Facebooks, the, uh, well, they call it Meta now, Adobe, Microsoft, Apple, it went down over 30%. And last year, my fund was able to make 29%. And there's one reason that we were able to do that. And there's one reason why our students were able to have profits in their portfolios, in their 401ks. And that comes down to understanding the standards and principles and the processes that we use and that I have created over the last 27 years. And it's so different. And this is one of the things that I need you guys to do as you're listening to this. I need you to keep an open mind. Because in the financial industry, which I've been around, and we're going to get into that in a second, 27 years, they kind of brainwash us in a certain way on how we should invest our money, right? We have, we, most of us work for companies, and you have these 401ks, people come in from Prudential or Vanguard, they tell you about index funds, they tell you about mutual funds, they tell you about this 60-40-20 split, and this is what we should do, and we should not touch it, and in 40 years, you're going to be fine, right? That's what we hear. But a lot of us, and I've spoken to a lot of people here, and I've traveled around and spoken to so many people about how they feel about their 401ks, and how many people in this room have opened up their 401ks in the last quarter? A couple. Not many people want to look at it. And that blows my mind, and that blows my mind when I say, why, not, why isn't everybody in this room? Because all of you in here have a business. You're trying to, or you're salespeople, you're trying to sell something, you're trying to grow a business, you're trying to make money. And in my eyes, why don't you learn a skill that can take the money you're making from that other business or that other sales job and use leverage to help you grow your wealth? And a lot of reasons why is because people don't have the proper education or they have the fear or they have these myths that I'm not smart enough or I'm bad at math and, or the, the stock market is rigged or the stock market is just too hard or I'm too busy. And I'm going to show you another way. So I want you to bear with me as I go through my story, because my story is so important, because I want everybody in this room to understand that what I've done over the last 27 years and what I've done over the last 10 years in my fund, you guys can do also. So there I am. Is How is a kid from Shirley, Long Island, who were able to go from nothing to be able to start to travel around with the Sharks, Kevin O'Leary, Barbara Corkin, Robert Hershevik, I'm on CNBC, uh, Reuters, Bloomberg. Well, again, oh, I went too far. I grew up in a small town in Shirley, Long Island, which is about an hour outside of New York City. My father is a corrections officer, was a corrections officer for 25 years at Rikers Island. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. My brother, sister, and I are the first generation in our family to go to college. And guess what? I'm dyslexic, right? So I am horrible. I was horrible at school. I was horrible at math. And you understand that our school systems, the way we teach our kids about financial education is nil, nothing, right? The way you get into uh, stock trading or investing or becoming an entrepreneur is you have to have someone in your family or a friend or you have to be good at math. Right, like so when you're in school, people push you towards math. No one ever told me I could be an investment banker on Wall Street and make $10 million a year, or run my own hedge fund and make over $12 million a year. No one ever said that to me because I was horrible at math. What they did was push me to things that I was good at, right? I was good at history. So I got pushed into history and political science. I had an interest in po political science. So I went off to the University of Rochester and I majored in political science. And my goal and my aspirations was one day, I was gonna become a lawyer, go back to Brooklyn where my family is originally from, and become an assistant district attorney, and one day, maybe become a lawyer. That was my, I mean, a, a, a politician. So, what I ended up doing, which happens a lot in life, I met a girl in college whose brother happened to be a head trader on Wall Street. So I took my first job in DC, making $17,500 as an assistant to a lobbyist. I was gonna study, retake the LSAT, and then go to law school. So I got accepted to a bunch of law schools in New York City and Washington, DC. 
but I was going a year later. So this girl would fly down from New York City. I had to bartend at night and wait tables because I'm making $17,500. You can't live off of that out of college. I'm living with six guys in one apartment, a one bedroom apartment in DC. And she would sit there and she would get annoyed because I'm trying to get tips and you know, when you try to get tips, you're very friendly. So she goes to her brother and she says, hey, she goes, I want you to give Jeff a job. So he calls me up, it's, February, it's uh, January of two, 1996. And he says, listen, my sister's miserable. I'm gonna give you a job making $75,000 to come up to New York and be my assistant but you need to take that job now because after April 1st, we don't hire anybody from that is not Ivy League. So all my family was up in New York. I go up. It's April 1st is my start date, 1996. Now, in between January and April, the girlfriend and I broke up. But, you know, the job is, I thought, was still there. So I show up on April 1st, 1996 at 50 Broad Street on New in New York City, which is right next to the New York Stock Exchange. I go up to the 13th floor at 7 a.m. I press the doorbell. He comes out, he goes, what are you doing here? I go, what do you mean? He goes, you don't have a job anymore. You broke up with my sister. <laughs> I swear, right there, sweat starts pouring off my face. He slams the door in my, in my face and I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm like, there's no cell phones back then. All I keep on thinking is my father and my brother are gonna kill me because I moved up all my stuff into my brother's apartment in New York City with his new wife and I had no job. And also, I turn around, I press the button, it's one of those old elevators, you see one, two, three, and then I hear all these guys behind me, I hear this laughter, and I'm like, what the, you know, I'm mad, and I'm pouring sweat, because I, when I get nervous, I sweat, and all of a sudden, the, the elevator opens up, and then I hear the door open up, he goes, April Fools, you, come on in! <laughs> I'm looking at him, I'm like, sweating, I mean, I mean sweat stains all over it. He's like, come on in, I was just playing with you. And he brings me into the room and I'm just like, I, I, my mind, trying to get my mind together. He sits me down and he goes, all right, and this is in front of about 50 traders and I don't know if anybody's seen a trading floor, there's all these computers and all these guys, there's yelling and talking. He sits me down, he goes, all right, I'm gonna explain what we do. He goes, we trade the NASDAQ long only, and I interrupt him, I put my hand up and I said, hey, What's the NASDAQ? <laughs> he goes, are you kidding me? He goes, do you even know what a stock is? And I'm like, not really. He's like, holy and bleep, 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 bleep. This is gonna be really hard to, to do. But the reason I'm telling you this story is that was April 1st, 1996. Now, fast forward to August, right? So April, May, June, July, five months, right? Five months later, I have to make a decision whether I'm gonna go to law school or not. And I had a really good July, and my first bonus check for August, I got on August 5th, 1996, was for $46,000 for one month's work. Well, thank you, yes? But that's not, it definitely excited me. I'm not gonna say didn't it excite me, it definitely excited me. I made more money than my father made in his base salary as a corrections officer in one month than he made in a whole year. But what amazed me and made me think was like, wow, if you get the right education, right? Like if you get that specific education, you get the right people around you and you get that support, I could do absolutely anything. And we could do absolutely anything. And it made me finally realize because I had no background in math. I was a hard, everybody told me I was just a, not that smart of a guy. But when I learned that specific skill of what they were doing, how they were doing it, and I had people there supporting me along the way, the upside was unlimited. So what ends up happening a few years later, that guy that gave me the job and scared the you know what out of me on April 1st, he decides he's gonna leave and start his own firm. So he asked me to come along and be a small partner in this firm. There were seven of us that left. We grew this firm from seven traders to 175 traders, and we sold it in 2001 to E-Trade Financial for $150 million. I was 20, thank you, yes. At 28 years old, it was freaking amazing, right? I thought I was king, you know what, right? And because I was an athlete and I was very driven, I set all these goals. I had eight figures in my checking account. And I wanted to turn that eight figures into nine, right? That's just the logical thing. And I set a plan out. I wanted to do it in 10 years. 
And what I did in three years completely amazes me to this day. I invested in multifamily development projects. I invested in the next trillion dollar industry, which is health and wellness, which we have health, uh, health thing here, which everybody knows. I invested in these things that were called reverse mergers, right, in Latin America and China, which is kind of like SPACs, if anybody's ever heard of a SPAC. I even gave an NFL football player, Hall of Famer, Heisman Trophy winner, I gave him a half a million dollars to do a, this unbelievable deal with Visa. And instead of taking me 10 years to get nine figures, in three years, I took that eight figures to zero. Think about that. I lost every single freaking penny that I made, and then some. And what I mean by then some, I was, thought I was king, you know what? So I was like, hey, I'm gonna start a fund and I'm gonna get all my mom and my brothers and all their friends and family members to invest in this fund. So how bad did it get? Well, I had to go home to my wife at the time because in my business, if you don't pay back your investors, you're done, you're history. So I went back to my wife at the time who was pregnant with twins and we had a three and a half year old daughter. We were living on Park Avenue in New York City and I'm like, we need to sell our apartment now. And we got very lucky and we sold our apartment and I was able to pay off my investors. But we moved to this small little town in New Jersey called Livingston, New Jersey. We got a little town home. And the first month I'm there, I had a new neighbor comes knocking on the door. He said, hey Jeff, there's someone milling around your car. And I'm like, oh, I know that. And I went in, I grabbed my keys from my Porsche Cayenne Turbo, and there was, there was the repo guy sitting there, and I gave him the keys. And he just put that shiny black SUV on the flatbed. And you know what happens in those little communities, right? These condo communities, what happens? All the people come out, and they want to know what the blink is going on, right? So they just sit there, and they're like, what's going on? And there's my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and asking me, where are they taking the Porsche or the car, right? I had to go back into the... Uh, the house, call my father on the phone and ask him, can I borrow his credit card so I could rent a car to take my ex, my wife at the time to the hospital to have the twins. Four days after that car was repossessed, I drove my twins home from the hospital in a rental car. Now when you think it can't get any worse, what usually happens? It gets worse, right? Nine months later, my father died in an accident. Now, you want to talk about hitting rock bottom. At that point, not only losing all my money and my things and all those friends you think you have, right? When you have money, everybody's your friend. But when it's gone, they all disappear. I lost my best friend. And at that moment, that was my rock bottom. How many people in this room have a story of their own of where coming close or hitting rock bottom? Let me see your show of hands, right? Let me tell you, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It absolutely 100% sucks. I sat there trying to blame everybody else but myself. I had all those people I thought were supporting me telling me, hey, you, you, you had a great run. Go get a normal job. One that pays you a salary and has health insurance and, and, you know, become a teacher. That was a big one. That came from my mom and my ex-wife, or my wife at the time. But what I decided at that point was that my father died at 62 years of age, and life was too short not to keep trying. So I wanted to know why I failed. I wanted to know at the time, it was 2008 or 2009, I wanted to know why all the banks on Wall Street failed and why people fail in general. And what I uncovered just shocked me because it all came down to having these simple principles and standards and processes. And what I am gonna share with you now with only about 12 minutes left is how I got from rock bottom to where I am today, managing over $125 million uh, and having those type of returns. I think it's a really important. So what is the difference between a successful or unsuccessful, I put up trader up here, but investor. And a lot of the stuff that I am gonna share, these principles and these standards and these processes are everything that you could put, not only in your investments, but in your businesses. 
So the difference between a successful, most people will say it's discipline, but it's not just discipline. It's about having the standards and the principles and the processes. So what are these principles or these standards? Number one, you need to invest with an edge. When anybody approaches me with an, uh, with an investment idea or one of your companies, someone came up to me, I want to know what's your edge. No matter what, you guys work so hard for your money. If you're going to give it to a financial advisor, if you're going to give your money to anybody, you want to know what their edge is. And let me tell you, we're listening to James Kramer on CNBC or reading an article about Apple's new Vision Pro, that's not an edge. An edge to me is having a competitive advantage over the other market participants. And the way I like to explain an edge is the way I kind of developed the processes that we use now. I looked at a casino. They have the edge, why? Because they have the probability and statistics on their side. So every time you place your hard earned money to work anywhere, you need to know what the edge is. Number two, manage your risk. It is one of these things, and I'm going through quick. So managing risk was one of the things that I learned the second week I was on the desk at Wall Street. I learned it from the oldest guy. And when I say the oldest guy, he was probably 45 at the time, and I'm older than that now. And he said to me, Jeff, if you want to be successful on Wall Street or anything when in investments, he goes, you need this in your mind before you do anything. And that is, if you take care of the downside, the upside will take care of itself. Think about that. If you're gonna write down anything for me, right there, if you take care of the downside, the upside will take care of itself. So you have to have an edge and you have to manage your risk. Now the way we teach our students and the way I use the strategies in my hedge fund, now I'm gonna get into stuff that is gonna seem awkward to you, right? You're gonna hear options, you're gonna hear futures, you're gonna hear stocks. It's all right and it's fine to be uncomfortable with those words, right? Because when I walk in to order uh, Starbucks for my three daughters and they sent me in there for the first time, do you ever go into all Starbucks and order something? It is like macadoodle this and a grande large that and it's really complicated. But after doing it five, six, seven, seven, 10 times, now I can have a nice conversation with the barista and know her name and order those. So when you're hearing me talk about this stuff, don't get scared, understand where we're coming from, right? So like I, one way we gain an edge, going back to the edge, is we start everybody with options to gain our edge. And the reason why we stop, start people with options is it's because it's based on math. And it's something that it's not my gut feeling, it's something that Jeff Tomasulo did not come up with. This is something that is truly based on math and gives you the probability and statistics they put the odds in your favor to be the casino. And I'm gonna give you an example on why we use options instead of you have an investment idea, you're like, hey, I can either buy this stock, I can invest in this stock or this mutual fund, or I cannot. And the reason why we use options, especially in smaller accounts, in $10,000 accounts, $20,000 accounts, $50,000 accounts. It allows you to make money efficiently. And I want you guys to think like professionals and professionals think with efficiency. So when you look at this, this is an example between what a stock, if I was gonna make a decision to buy a stock or use an option trade. So this is a real trade that we put on. Right here, a stock trade would have cost me $2,060. If I bought an option trade, it cost me 2100 Apples to apples, right? The stock goes up, we profited 460 bucks, 22%. The option trade, one contract, which equals about 100 shares of stock, we were able to profit $1,600. That's a 76% return. So when you're thinking about, hey, how am I gonna invest my money? You wanna do it efficiently. What is the most efficient way to do that? By buying a stock or buying an option? We show you that buying a, uh, an option is much more efficient. Now, people would argue, well, you said an option contract is 100 shares of stock. This is when you think about how big your accounts are. $20,000 account, a $10,000, a $5,000 account. If I wanted to buy 100 shares of a firm, whatever that day was, it would have cost me $10,300 to get 100 shares. If I use an option contract, 
it would have cost me $2,100. When you think about managing your risk, how much do you want, if worst case scenario, you lose everything, would you rather lose $10,000 or would you rather lose $2,100? You have to think about risk and efficiency and your edge, right? Same thing, you make $2,300, it's a 22% profit, 76%, 1600. The, th the key here is to understand the concepts and the processes and the standards. All right, managing your risk, we talked about that. Taking care of your downside, always understanding where the risk lies. Here's a perfect example. When I was going through all those problems, and I, I mean, when I was making all those investments, I used to say to my wife at the time, worst case scenario, we live with your mother. Guess what? We had to go live with my mother-in-law, right? Worst case scenarios can happen. So in the forefront of your brain, whether it's your business, whether you're investing your money in a mutual fund, you want to know what's the worst case scenario that can happen to your investments, to your business. You have to write them down. You have to understand them. And here goes, and I'm flying through this because I am running out of time. The reason why is because the fear, the reason we have fear is because we have a lack of knowledge. The way you, can, you are able to grab fear by its neck and is to understand everything about it. And that's how we approach risk. I want to know where all the risk lies. So when the worst case scenario does happen, we are prepared for it. So some of the pitfalls of investing and why people are not successful in investing. We're going to go through this here. Trading without an edge. No risk management. And this is key, trades are correlated. What does that mean, this fancy word correlated? Well, most of the stocks, the S&P 500, makes up about the largest uh, 500 US companies in the United States. When, they, when the stock market goes up, most of the time, all of them go up. When the stock market goes down, most of the time, all those stocks go down. Those, that's called correlation. Too many people are correlated in your portfolios. If you went and looked at your 401k statements, I will guarantee that most of you own Apple, Microsoft, all these big tech companies. They are very correlated. So when you ask yourself, why did I lose money last year in my 401ks? It's because you were very correlated. And we're gonna get that into that in a second. Not having a proven, repeatable process. I can't tell you when I talk to business owners, when I ask them their process, they can't even tell me their process. If you can't tell me and you can't explain it, it is not repeatable. And especially if you're gonna invest in the markets, you want someone that has a repeatable, proven repeatable process. You don't wanna be a one hit wonder. How many people in here can tell me who Scott Mitchell is? You can, wow, that's impressive. Scott Mitchell was a famous quarterback, but everybody in here can tell me who Tom Brady is. Right, Rebecca Black, Taylor Swift. Right, everybody knows who's Taylor Swift. Not many people know who Rebecca Black is, right? Right, Tom's, Tom Cruise and Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson was a famous actor back in the 80s, right? Had a couple of good ones. You do not want to do that, even in your business. This is part of your edge. And then managing your emotions, they do not manage their emotions well, and the lack of quality mentorship. And I heard someone speaking at this conference about mentorship, and this is something that people don't want to do. They don't want to pay for it. Sometimes you need to pay to have a really good team around you. And when I look back at the mistakes that I made back uh, you know, in 2005, six and seven that led me to lose all that money, I didn't have the right accountants. I didn't have the right lawyers. I was so darn cheap to hire consultants to help me protect my wealth. And sometimes you have to do it. So I got two minutes left here. I want to go over the three principles that have made me super successful in my fund. And this is trading non-correlated, having a proven repeatable process, and managing your emotions. So let me just flip through here. Trading non-correlated. Now, this is a picture of uh, Warren Buffett who always talks about risk, right? But the one guy that I had changed my life happened in 1998, and it was Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio said, Find me 13 non-correlated assets, and I will find you someone who is consistent at making money in the markets. Well, what is non-correlation? We told you what correlation is. So let me show you this. This was what I was talking about. What correlation is? You have 
the uh, S&P 500, which was those 500 stocks. You have MasterCard, McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, Home Depot, IBM. They're all, look at that, they all go up and they all go down. That is how you lose money when the stock market drops 20% or 30%. How do we stop that? Well, here's one, oil and Tesla. Sometimes it goes up together, sometimes they don't, but they're pretty non-correlated, right? Here's one that's really big, the S&P 500 and we, completely non-correlated. You want to be able to have non-correlated assets in your portfolio so you can make money whether the stock market goes up down or sideways. The next one is to have a repeatable, proven repeatable process. This is why we focus on math. Now this isn't coming from a guy who has no background in math, who couldn't even figure out, but what we have today is computers, right? We have, we've come up with, and one of the reasons E-Trade bought my company back in 2001 was our software. Now with computer software, you, all this mathematical formulas that are so complicated now can be put in graphs and it could be put on uh, scales, which I'll show you some, an algorithm that we created that is on zero to 10. And all you need to do is have the knowledge to interpret that and you can make powerful decisions on your investments. That's what, ha you know, when you are able to put math around the strategies, you become much more repeatable. And then the last one, right, is to have a brief, oh, I forgot about this. This is when you have a repeatable process, you can see how well this turns out. These are real trades that we've made. We've sent out to our students and we have actually made in my hedge fund. You can see 26% in four days, 45% in 10 days. That is why we are successful. It's not the numbers that are so nice to have, which they are. It is about having a, re a proven repeatable process. This is the volumeter that we, uh, this is one of the tools that I created, the algorithm. And I, I want to show you real quick. So these are some examples, 20% in 40 days, 3% in 15 days. Here's something that's really key. Those numbers sound great, but you can also have the right idea and still lose money if you don't have a proven repeatable process, right? So understanding the right, and understanding and having people to be able to teach you the right tactics to use and the right strategies to use how bad is it to, when you sometimes you know something's going to happen, but you use the wrong strategy and you lose money? There's nothing more frustrating than that, to do that. So last year, so we have this service that we give to our students, because this is the way I learn, is that we send out our trade alerts. So every time I place an option trade, I send it to our students. So when people are like, oh, I hear all this all the time about options, how are you successful? Well, we keep track, right? We keep data. And here is it, last year we sent out, which I think 109 trades, 98 of them were successful. We had an 89.91 hit ratio last year to our students. And I'm showing you that number because it is impressive, but what I like about it, it is this is how we teach our students, right? We show them, we teach them, and we support them. There's nothing worse than going on the internet and learning something and then having no one really explain the intricacies of it. And the way I learned how to trade was I sat behind someone for 30 days and I saw them get in and get out. They talked to me about that. And that's why we send out trade alerts. It's not so you can try to make money. It's for you to learn and to make your learning curve a lot quicker. Now I'm out of time here, but the last thing I really wanted to bring up was managing your emotions. We hear about why people don't get, I told you why people don't get involved in the stock market. It's the fear, it's this emotion, or even when you're in the stock market, how many people have made a trade in the stock market. Anybody in here? Let me tell you, when you place a trade, how many times do you look at your phone when it goes, it's starting to go against you, right? Like you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? And you have this because in all reality, we don't know what a stock is going to do. We don't know if it's gonna go up or down. People like to tell you they do, but they're full of shit. They really don't. And that's why you're looking at your phone all the time, right? Because you're like, oh my God, it's the uncertainty. Well, let me tell you something. Having non-correlation, these principles, right? And let me just go through the standard principles. When you trade with an edge, when you manage your risk, when you have a uh, trade non-correlated, when you have a proven repeatable process, those emotions now become your superpower instead of your kryptonite. You eliminate all those emotions. 
because you have a proven repeatable process, because you have the standards. That is what's the major change there. And I see you coming up. I'm almost done here. I'm finishing up. There it is. That's the Superman thing. So I want to leave you with the last bit. And this is really important because my father died in an accident. So this was my last conversation I had with my father. And he said something that is stuck with me to that day. He said, hey, listen, I, and I was losing all my money at the time when he died. And he said, listen, I don't want you to stop taking risks. I don't want you to stop trying. He goes, I never want you to live your life with a regret. And he said, I never want you to utter these words. I should have, I could have, I would have. And folks, I want you guys to take the little bit that I was able to share with you today. I want you to come to our booth because I want you to get the right education. I want you to start to think differently and I want you to take action. Because if you take action now, it can change your financial futures forever and your family's financial futures. Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much.